a new series. We're going to look at, over the next seven weeks, the seven guiding values of the 4C and how they fit into the irreducible core. Which we looked at last month. Now, it's important that you understand that just like when we preach the creed in the fall, we are not preaching the values themselves. These values are merely reflections of scriptural truth. And so when we talk about these seven guiding values, we're actually talking about the scriptures that, that these values reflect. So we're not preaching the values, we're preaching the scriptures these values reflect. And the 4C has prayed over this and they have uh, sought God on this and sought and studied the scriptures on this and they have given us instruction that come directly from the word and so we will we are going to look at the passages behind them and the goal here is to is twofold one I want to help you understand the teachings of the conference which you are part of so that you are more connected with the conference that you are a part of. And second, I want to help you apply these values to these three ideas that we talked about, the two great commandments and the great commission of love God, love people, and make disciples. So with that, our first value is a culture of believing prayer and intercession. So turn in your Bibles with me to one of the passages that that value reflects to the book of 1 Timothy, and we are in chapter 2, and we're only doing verses 1 through 5. So let's read together the word of God from 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 5. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Father, our Savior who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and man, the human Christ Jesus. May God bless to our hearts this reading of his holy word. Now, I want to start out by saying that you require little instruction on prayer. On believing prayer and intercession. In our first year here, it's been evident to us that you are a church that believes in the power of prayer. So much of what is said today is by way of reminding. We've also preached on prayer twice this year already. And so we will... Uh, and those verses will come into our sermon today. One of those passages will be in our in our message today. But we don't need to cr to rehash a lot of ground. So it'll be a lot of reinforcement and a lot of reminding. Now that doesn't mean there won't be instruction. So please don't. Tune out. There is some an area where we do require instruction, so please pay attention and don't just tune out. Last week, when we were in Second Timothy, and for the next two weeks, we will actually be in First Timothy, and I want to remind you that Timothy is left at Ephesus for one specific purpose, to put in order what has been torn asunder by false teachers. As we saw last week, the 
church in Ephesus is uh, one messed up little church. They're dealing with syncretism, asceticism, gossip, infighting, slander, myths, and foolish speculations about genealogy. We tend to think of the Galatians and the Corinthians as messed up churches, but they seem to have very little on Ephesus. It's so bad that Paul has actually has to refer back to the created order. And he even uses very uncommon language, so much so that some have questioned Pauline authorship. Though we accept Paul as the author. So 1 Timothy is a hard book to understand and interpret, and for that reason we take extra caution in how we handle it. Now, in the interest of full disclosure, we all know everyone has a favorite book of the Bible, right? We all have one that we spend more time in, and First and Second Timothy have been mine. I preached all the way through them once, taught two comprehensive Sunday school classes on them, and along with the book of Isaiah and Matthew, they've been my theological playground since college. More so than other books. One day I'll preach through them for you, for you. But today we're just focused on one passage. As with letters in the ancient world, it's addressed to Timothy, but it would have been read to the entire congregation. In chapter 1, Paul has laid out the problem. The Ephesians have been led astray and gone after false doctrines. They have, they have ruined their witness so much that, they have, that Paul has even had to excommunicate Hymenaeus and Alexander for their heresy. And in chapter 1, he begins addressing the specific issues and how to correct them. So everything that you read in the book of 1st and 2nd Timothy is a, is, has, is a response to a specific issue. I cannot stress that enough. And the first response then in chapter 2 is to bring the Ephesians back to prayer. The starting point then for a church in chaos is prayer, and prayer is the topic of chapter 2, 1 through 15. The entire passage deals with prayer. Paul then starts with an exhortation that they should offer prayers. And these are not just four different types of prayers, they are but they're also a model for the flow of prayer. Like Jesus in Matthew 6, we start with praising God and then confessing our sin to Him, but then we move on to our requests, our entreaties for ourselves and then for others. These are intercessions. Anything that is on our heart and our mind, and then we end with thanksgiving, with Eucharist, thankfulness to God for what He has already accomplished and will do on our behalf and on behalf of our neighbors. Now, there's an important point here because we don't often or because Paul does not stop at this pattern of prayer. He goes on, he ends the verse with, For all people. Thus, while there are things you can pray for yourself, the first thing Paul wants the Ephesians to do is pray for others. For everyone. Part of the problem in Ephesus was that the church had turned in on itself. That's a sign. One of the signs of that is gossip and is slander. That Paul mentions later in the book. It had become inwardly focused. And so the 
first thing that Paul wants them to do is to look outside themselves and their own little worlds. To the needs and concerns of others. But they're not to stop there. They're not to stop with their neighbor. They should also pray for all who are in authority, for rulers and for kings. And in doing so, two things will happen. One, we naturally have a peace about us because we are connected to the God of peace. That's Philippians 4. So we naturally live peaceful and quiet lives because we are in prayer. And we naturally will live godly and dignified lives because we are connected to God. We are praying to God. We are engaging in the transformational part of our relationship with God through study of the Word and through prayer. So we are naturally living this quiet and peaceful life, godly and dignified. But two, by praying for the salvation of our leaders, we create a situation where we are not, where we are at peace. Where we are at peace. Okay? Understand this. We as Christians should be living a quiet and peaceful life, godly and dignified in every way. But we should also pray for the salvation of our leaders so that as we grow in that and they come to know Jesus, That would abate the persecution. Just as Jerem as God sent to Judah by the pen of Jeremiah in 29, they were to pray for the shalom of the city to which I am sending you, that in seeking its shalom you would find yours. There's a principle at work here if you Pray and intercede on behalf of your leaders. Pray that they find salvation. Then when they do, you will also have peace, peace in the land which you are living in. So you are called to live a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified. But you should also pray for your leader, that your leaders are saved so that you can do that without the threat of persecution. Now, consider how offensive this is to the original audience, right? This is written sometime around 63, 64. Uh, Paul is, of course, killed sometime in after this at the hands of Nero, who was just coming to power and just beginning his persecution, so it's absolutely essential not only that Christians live out their witness in a manner that was good and pleasing to God, but also that they pray for their leader's salvation. Pray for Nero. <laughs> yeah, I'd have a hard time with that. Pray for Nero. So this life here, this life of prayer, peaceful and quiet, godly and dignified in every way, is a life that is good and pleasing in God's sight. So praying for all our rulers and authorities is good and pleasing in the sight of God. Why? Look at verse 4. For God desires all to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. God desires all to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Truth. This is the desire of God for all to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And the way that happens is partly, partly through the witness of Christians on this earth. The Ephesians, the Ephesians have actually been hindering that task. They have been uh, hindering the desire of God because the way
way they are living is driving people away from God. Brad Stein says, if uh, you, uh, in one of his comedy routines, that he believes that everything we do as Christians should bring people to the cross, not away from the cross. And when Christians act crazy, we actually drive people away from the cross. And he says a good rule of thumb is, if a mass murderer tried it, you should probably go another direction. They've been hindering the desire of God, but this doesn't mean that everyone will be saved. Why? Because God has given a decree by which that must happen. That is, through Jesus Christ, who died and was buried and rose again on the third day. And one of the ways that people come to hear of this decree is through the witness of those who believe in him. And who have been radically transformed by him. The life of the believer is to point people to Jesus, and we should pray that people are saved through Christ, through Christ by seeing and hearing the witness of his followers. When we do this, Christ, who is our human mediator, okay, he's still incarnate, he's our human mediator in heaven, he hears on our behalf, and he stands up to answer and, and argue on our behalf. That's the role of the mediator, as Paul is describing it here. He hears our prayers, and then he prays or uh, argues on our behalf. That those prayers would be answered. Now, this is where the instruction that I mentioned in the introduction comes in. In our day and age, multiple studies and just a brief survey, I've mentioned this before, of Facebook comment sections, find that Christians are actually better at outrage than we are living a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. We're better at talking about how bad our culture has become, gawking at the sin of the world and shaming it and shunning it, than we are at praying for it. We love to talk about our leaders on the opposite side of the aisle, or even those on our own side. We love to gossip and slander them, and be outraged about them, but when was the last time we actually prayed for their salvation? Ed Stetzer has even written a book on the topic called Christians in the Age of Outrage, and I recommend picking it up on Audible or Kindle or ordering it from Barnes & Noble. In the book, he outlines how outrage culture has invaded Christianity and walks through the biblical passage like ours this morning to explain why it should not be this way. We would rather complain about our enemies than pray for them. And yet, Jesus has instructed us to pray for our enemies, to love our enemies, and to pray for those who persecute us. No wonder the world looks at us and says, you don't actually believe this. You don't live it. Church, if we're not going to pray for our world and its leaders, why are we surprised the world is turning against God and against the gospel? This is why we believe in a culture of believing prayer and intercession because if we really believe in prayer we need, and the power of prayer, then we need to believe that God can intervene in every situation. That God can bring even the worst person on this earth to himself. Recently, we've been praying with Aaron before bed, and the First night, in the middle of the prayer, she looked up at me and signed, All done, Daddy. But after a few weeks, when I was 
when I said amen, she started doing a little dance with a big smile on her face. And I'm not going to demonstrate it for you because it's not as cute when I do it. But she gets a huge smile on her face and gets really excited. And in my spiritual imagination, I think in some way she's aware and gets excited because she knows that God will answer her prayers, that God will watch over her mommy and daddy and her nana and papa, her grandma and grandpa, and all her aunts and uncles and cousins. That in some part of her spirit, God is drawing her, even at 15 months. And that she anticipates that God will answer her prayers. I may be crazy, and you can tell me if I am. But that's what I think. What if, like Aaron, when we said amen, we got excited about what, is God, what God is going to do, instead of saying amen and then going back to our day-to-day -day lives we lived before, without anticipation, without eagerness, but what if we lived with this anticipation and eagerness? What if we looked and said, Wow, God, how are you going to fulfill your desire? How can my life be a testimony to you so that your desire is filled? How can I live the peaceful and quiet life, dignified and godly in every way, so that those people around me who I'm praying for by name come to know you? What if, instead of participating in the outrage of our world, we did the opposite? And when a situation arises that people get outraged over, instead of joining in, we stop and we pray for that person or that situation and believe that God is going to act. On your inserts that you can download with the announcements today, there's a uh, line that says, "If or think of a person that you would like to come to know Christ. Write their name here and commit to pray for them. Daily. Believing that God will reach their hearts wherever they're at. And do so for our town. for our local, state, and national leaders. So how does this fit into the irreducible core? Because that's, our, again, our paradigm, these two great commandments and the great commission of Jesus. Well, one way we love God is by li living the way he has put before us to live, and that includes this quiet and peaceful life that is godly and dignified in every way. Praying for all people, which, by the way, is loving people. If you really love people, you pray for their salvation and then live out your faith knowing that God will use them to attract them to Him. You love people by praying for them. And finally, you make disciples by praying that they might come to know Jesus as Lord and personal Savior. Pray even when you do not think it will do any good. Live the life of prayer and pray for everyone, especially your enemies or those who persecute you. Pray that they come face to face with Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Pray that God's desire is fulfilled and that people will hear the decree. And the decree is this. People would believe that Jesus died on the cross like he said he would. He was buried like he said he would be. He rose again on the third day just as he said he would. And he ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father as our mediator. And one day he's coming back and he's coming back as judge. But until then, we are called to help fulfill the desire of God by the way we live and the way we pray and believing what we pray will come to pass. But you know, Christ did all this not because he considered it 
equality with God, something to be grasped, but humbled himself to death, even death on the cross. And he did it because he loves you. He gave himself for you out of that love. Let's talk. Dear Heavenly Father, you are God. I say that every time, but I can't get it out of my head. You are who you say you are. You do what you said you will do. By your great and marvelous Oh, we need you. Father, will you come into our midst and remind us that, yes, we believe that you can heal, but also help us to believe that you can save by your mighty hand, to avoid outrage culture, and to live by your love. Peaceful and quiet life, dignified and godly in every way. We love you, Lord, and we praise you. May you do these things, and may we believe that you will do them, that you would bring our town to you, by the way we live as the church. In the name of the Father, and in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit, we pray, and all God's children say,